Okay, so this is the ninth lecture in this series, this class on creating an international sustainable civilization, bringing all the pieces together, although it's not even all the pieces. I have other pieces on um, my YouTube channel on Martha Catherine Beck. It's Dr. Martha Catherine Beck. Greek philosophy. So I have uh, 10 other playlists and 76 videos related to the legacy of ancient Greek civilization in the era of globalization. So, so this um, particular lecture is about systems thinking, creating a sustainable civilization, but it depends a lot, or it includes a lot of Aristotle. But my other work is how Aristotle is an articulation of many other aspects of ancient Greek civilization. But also Aristotle is, the Greeks are one, one branch of the wisdom traditions, the ancient traditions. And I don't know those traditions as well as the Greeks. But there are definitely similarities between ancients and, and differences between ancients and moderns. So the similarities between the ancients and moderns are probably greater than the, than the difference between ancients and moderns. Um, the thing that I like to emphasize, which I do not think is, and I, well, I know it's not unique to the Greeks. Um, the ancient tribal indigenous cultures uh, were, many of them were more democratic than the Greeks, but the particular way of developing democracy and citizen consciousness, and then the particular ways that they corrupted it and lost it, I think are a good lesson for every society today. That's, if it's democratic, it's being undermined, it's being lost because of the types of corruption uh, Plato mentions and the Greek poets mention. Or in a country like Indonesia that's trying to develop its democracy, I think the Greeks have some suggestions for how to structure institutions or how the kind of thinking that they want to cultivate in their citizens. Um, but this particular lecture is again the kind of thinking you want to cultivate in women and that's a big transition that's over half the population um, in the past the belief was that men are naturally more intelligent uh, aristotle himself said uh, men are capable of theoretical thinking and the highest kind of thinking and women are not and women achieve their final cause, their ultimate kind of flourishing at home in the household, whereas men achieve their final cause, which is the final cause of humanity in political association, political leadership, um, and intellectual theorizing and um, leadership and all that um, free scientific inquiry, free um, speculative intellectual inquiry. So women were shut out from that and that's false. <laughs> you know, I hope I would be exhibit A of why that's not true. Obviously when I read that, it I just glossed over it because I thought if Aristotle were alive, he wouldn't agree with himself. Um, he would change his mind. And it's not a big deal. Well, in my life, I ran into a lot of patriarchy and I ran into a lot of Aristotle scholars who have a very Western white male privileged intellectual bias that they're not aware of. And this is very harmful. I hope they can live more examined lives and become more aware of their bias. But the lecture for today that would be a Socratic issue where Socrates goes and talks to people and asks them embarrassing questions. 
<laughs> but this is about women and learning how, uh, figuring out how to include women. It also starts out with uh, Marif's book. So we're back to Marif, Indonesia, Islam, humanity, and Indonesian identity. And so he thinks that women's equality is perfectly consistent with both Panchasila and Islam. So I have arguments from his book. And of course, I agree with it. I just think there are similar arguments in the other wisdom traditions. And so the view of spirituality itself isn't sexist. It's the way a culture um, assimilates it. It gets caught up with power, wealth, cultural institutions, the needs to raise kids, um, leading to forcing women into the household and then leading to a whole ideology that that's where she belongs and all that. So, so there is a difference between the tradition spirituality and then how it gets institutionalized and reduced to some kind of sexism. So those are, in some of my later lectures, I get more specific about that. But this one is about Marif and um, Indonesia and how, how to make a monist. Now we have, we can agree on monism, but okay. So unity and diversity in Panchasila is very similar to the United States. So this is principle number three in Panchasila, unity and diversity. Um, and it's similar to the U.S. Both nations were democracies in places where citizens from many different races, ethnicities, religious traditions, cultural backgrounds lived. I would say Indonesia is much more so than the U.S., but the U.S. was trying to have the most diversity among Western nations at the time. They allowed in many different denominations of Christians. And those denominations, the beliefs people had really disagreed with each other, but they separated what they believed in church from their what they believe, how they relate to each other as citizens. Um, so in both nations, local differences were respected, recognized, and celebrated. So in the U.S., we had the states. So we had a federalist system. Some the states would have control of the legal system within the state, except that it had to be checked out by the Supreme Court, the federal courts, and then the Supreme Court to make sure that the laws the states made did not conflict with the Constitution. Um, and then in Indonesia, they have provinces. Um, they have 17,000 islands. I mean, they have incredible diversity. It's sort of amazing how they keep it all together, but so far they've managed to. Um, Aristotle supports this kind of nation as the best, especially when a nation is based on trying to be, trying to be based on a democratic political system and culture. So based on or trying to be based on a democracy. Aristotle argued against rulers who focus too much on unity and made their decisions with the goal of unifying a nation. Instead, he claimed the best societies were our pluralities. The Greek gods and goddesses all represented different types of people, different aspects of a healthy culture. So there was a natural connection between the religious tradition and a democratic and pluralistic social and political culture. And sometimes those deities got... Um, were at odds with each other and the human beings that they possessed were at odds with each other. But part of the lesson there is human beings need to compromise. They need to recognize the sanctity of all of those deities or all of those passions that we can have, justice, truth, beauty, uh, wilderness protection, 
um, leaving behind a legacy, integrating culture and nature, um, sensuality, using the arts to get to a spiritual life. So there's lots of them and they conflict, but human beings need to compromise and integrate them. So that would mean there's a plurality in the sense that some people really are driven to be uh, artists. Some are driven to write plays. Some are driven to write poems. Some are driven to dance, music. So those are the muses, the nine muses of Hesiod. They're all trying, they're all kinds of pattern recognition and they're all trying to educate our emotions so that we make good choices in life. And um, so even, yeah, there's all those muses and then there's the love of justice and then there's the love of truth in a science way. Then there's the love of the wilderness preservation. Then there's the love of uh, integrating uh, Demeter, respecting the goddess of the earth, respecting the god of the sea, um, integrating nature and culture, and, and thinking about the legacy that you're going to leave behind. So that's respecting Hades and Persephone, the god and goddess of the underground. Like after you're dead, what will you have left behind um, what stories will people tell about you? Okay, so Marif, he links Islam, pluralism, and democracy. Within the concept of pluralism, all uniqueness and diversity must be admitted as mental facts that are inherent in humanity's spiritual structure. All right? So this is spiritual, humanism, and religious pluralism. To arrive at this admission, there's no other way but that people develop the culture of high tolerance, acknowledging the diversity and complexity consciously and with a positive attitude. It's not just religion and culture that are diverse, but also language and skin color that are variegated and complex. Try to follow the meaning of this verse. So he's quoting from the Quran. And of his sign is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your colors. Indeed, in that are signs for those of knowledge. So here's an excellent example of how monism can be tied to diversity, uh, cultural pluralism, straight out of the Quran. Before Allah, the position of a woman is equal to that of a man. Both genders, before Allah doesn't mean, <laughs> yeah, it means in, in, in respect to Allah, in the face of Allah, the way Allah looks at things. Women and men are equal. Both genders can have relationship with Allah without an intermediary. This is important because... St. Paul, I mean, documents, you know, and other traditions are much less egalitarian. In the Jewish tradition, there is a prayer saying, thank God I wasn't born a woman, which doesn't mean Judaism can't be egalitarian. It can, but it still has some leftover um, quotes. Um, if someone performs good deeds, Allah will not differentiate between a man and a woman in allotting the rewards reserved for them. Verse 97 of one of the surahs explains those just rewards. Whoever, um, whoever is righteous, whether male or female, whether he or she is a believer, we will surely cause him to live a good life. And we will surely give them their reward in the hereafter, according to the best of what they used to do. So this is about leaving a legacy behind. And it's about your righteousness is a certain way of living. And men and women are equally capable of an equally high level of righteousness, even atheists as opposed to believers. So, you know, Muhammad on these quotes in the Quran, or you could say God, because supposedly 
Gabriel is just dictating from God what Muhammad, the Quran. So it's very egalitarian and it's very, um, the diversity includes atheists. And I do have a whole separate uh, lecture about that. But again, that's important and it's, um, not the stereotype we have about Islam and the Quran. In the Quran, quote, if there's any difference between the sexes, it's entirely due to personal achievement, which is open to everyone, not due to a difference of sex. We read this provision in Asuria, verse 13. O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female and made you people and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous. All right. The way Muhammad treated women to reinforce our arguments. So it isn't just that's a quote from the Quran, the story of Muhammad's life, the legacy he left behind in his life story. To reinforce our arguments for male-female equality, let us link this discussion with uh, Khadija, his um, first wife. She hired him. She was 15 years older than him. And, and she hired him to take care of his camels, I think. She was his employer and later the wife of Muhammad, long before he became a prophet. She was the one who stood at the forefront to defend the prophet because her faith was hard and steel, as hard as steel, and her mind functioned perfectly. The assumption that religious traditions are always sexist is wrong. The cultures within which ancient wisdom traditions were practiced were sexist. The original leaders and original teachings were often understood as sexist or ignored in favor of other parts of each tradition's holy texts that were written by someone else who was sexist. Scholars have pointed this out, but they're often ignored. So we do have to keep that in mind. Muhammad, Jesus, Socrates, and Aristotle. Just to give some examples, Jesus also treated women as equals, the story of Mary and Martha. Socrates' two teachers were women, his mother and Diotima. He was very critical of male aggression, war, greed, pride, and the vices associated with machismo that do so much damage to women. So women are capable of those vices and men are capable of being nurturing and not being that way. But there is this tendency and Socrates was very much, he was not machismo. He would be considered kind of a wimp among the other Athenians. Um, he spent his time in the private sector in over in the Agora. He didn't, you know, he didn't exercise political power, economic power. He he went where citizens could go, but nobody with power or money went to the Agora very often. Uh, he spent his time there. That's where women went to shop but also where people came to talk about public affairs. Aristotle was ahead of his time with women, but he was not egalitarian. He said that um, women's final causes in the household and men should make the final decision, but they should talk it over with their wives. Like women are capable of deliberating, but they're not, they should not make the final decision. And there's people in the US, especially grandparents generation, my grandparents, I think, some of my students' grandparents, but the expression is the man wears the pants, which means you can talk together a lot, but at the end of the day, he's the one that makes the decision. Um, the trouble is, um, Muhammad was more progressive about women than Aristotle. And this, this has been a huge problem in Western culture because Aristotle's theory doesn't, the theory, the idea of flourishing does not require any difference between men and women. It even 
seems intuitively obvious to somebody now that there is no difference between men and women. They, they all have to exercise self-control, courage, generosity, but within a culture, the expectations for self-control, courage, and generosity um, are sexist, which there isn't any reason that they need to be. When I was lecturing on Aristotle's social, personal, and political virtues, nobody needed to bring in any difference between men and women. I would hope that any women listening would assume that they're just as much of a human being as a man. But um, so Aristotle's theory doesn't require a difference. So Aristotle scholars today apply Aristotle's virtues equally to men and women. The trouble is the culture within which we operate is sexist. And I ran into a lot of that. Um, I don't know what it's like for women 50 years younger than I am trying to get through life without uh, finding out that um, there's institutionalized sexism. I mean, I read about it, especially having a child tends to lead, uh, set women back or fall back into a lot of old stereotypes. So we still have things to work on, but, um, but we have to keep in mind, I think, uh, an egalitarian, you can and you really have to link the wisdom traditions with gender equality, even though they haven't been in the past. I think it's the, it's the fair way to understand what those people were trying to get at. There's nothing in the human spirit that's gendered. <laughs> that has to do with culture. Um, okay, so...